Hello, and welcome to Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici's virtual roundtable discussion on childcare issues during the pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us. Congresswoman Bonamici will begin her remarks in just a few minutes. Afterward, she will be joined by Rashid Malik from the Center for American Progress, and then by a panel of experts for a roundtable discussion. If you would like to ask the Congresswoman or panelists a question during the Q&A portion of the event, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen while logged into Zoom. All lines will be muted until the roundtable discussion. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Congresswoman Bonamici knows that these are very challenging times with many of us worried about loved ones who are sick or vulnerable. She is particularly concerned about the significant effects of this crisis on our nation's fragile childcare and early learning programs. So the workers and educators in those programs and the families who rely on them. Congress has taken important steps to support the child care system in stimulus efforts, but it's far from the investment that is urgently needed. Access to high quality child care is essential to the well being of families and children, and it will be a key factor in reopening communities safely by allowing parents to return to work. To provide more insight into how this pandemic has affected the child care sector and to discuss the urgency of providing significant additional federal funding. To address these issues, Congresswoman Bonamici has invited Rashid Malik from the Center for American Progress and a panel of experts from Oregon and across the country to join the discussion. If you have just joined us, welcome to Congresswoman Bonamici's virtual roundtable discussion on child care issues during the pandemic. If you would like to ask a question during the roundtable discussion, please type into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now we'll go ahead and get started. Here is Congresswoman Bonamici. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you to everyone for joining us, particularly our panel of experts and to my staff for organizing this important event. We're here today because childcare is one of the most pressing issues during the pandemic and addressing it has to be a priority. Uh, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has upended lives, livelihoods, and our economy. And over the last few months, I've spoken with many of the people I'm honored to represent about the toll the pandemic is taking on them. We know families are facing stressful challenges and troubling uncertainty. Many people have been laid off. They're trying to make ends meet with no income or oftentimes reduced income. Many are balancing the full-time job of parenting while also trying to work from home. Meanwhile, other families may have one or more essential workers requiring them uh, to serve on the front lines of the pandemic. Um, and the additional burdens of little or no revenue, lower enrollment, and increased costs and time dedicated to, cl to cleaning and childcare uh, with childcare providers causes serious concerns. Um, and it's important to meet public health guidelines. We know that oftentimes essential workers have to put their kids in emergency childcare with family members, neighbors, or friends. Um, access to high quality, affordable childcare has always been fundamental to the well being of families and children. And today's working parents depend on high quality childcare so they can work and support their families. As a mom of two, even though my kids are, are grown, I've long recognized the importance of affordable and high quality uh, childcare. Uh, it is also foundational to our economy. Consider this, the United States economy loses $57 billion annually in lost earnings, lost productivity, and lost revenue because of childcare challenges. A parent who's, who is afraid that her son's provider will close told me, if childcare crumbles, if it gets even a fraction more difficult to find, then our collective ability to work crumbles too. Childcare will be a key factor in reopening our community safely by making it possible for parents to return to work. And unfortunately, despite the important role that childcare plays in making other work possible, the childcare sector has largely been undervalued and already faced serious challenges in Oregon and across the country long before the pandemic. We must now simultaneously address the ongoing childcare crisis while battling the effects of COVID-19 on this fragile industry and the families who rely on it. In my recently re released report on the childcare crisis, I called for a dual focus, stabilizing 
and vastly improving the system in ways that support positive learning growth uh, and development of children, support the families who need care, and support the dedicated workers who provide it. And in today's event, I want to spend the majority of our time focusing on the stabilizing piece uh, that has to come first, or there will be little left on which to improve. Uh, because every state was already a childcare desert, we're going to hear about this uh, shortly, before the pandemic, our economy, our children, and our families truly cannot afford to lose any providers. I am pleased to be joined by Rashid Malik of the Center for American Progress, or CAP, and our distinguished panelists who will help illustrate the sense of urgency and dire need for immediate and significant federal investment. CAP's new tool, um, which I have explored and is really enlightening, uh, provides a detailed and practical view of the nation's many childcare deserts before the pandemic. And it makes clear that without significant federal investment, the resulting childcare closures will disproportionately affect certain communities, particularly uh, low income and middle income communities, black and Hispanic families and rural families. Yesterday, I introduced a child care resolution expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that all young children and families should have access to high quality child care that is affordable for families. I was pleased to be joined by uh, many of my colleagues, including representatives Catherine Clark and Rosa DeLauro, who have been leaders on this issue for years. And I've been a strong supporter of congressional efforts so far that have provided $8.3 billion in emergency funding for childcare workers and families, we know it's not enough. And in the coming weeks, the House will vote on two childcare bills. This is very encouraging. One is the Child Care is Essential Act, uh, which will provide $50 billion in direct grant funding to help childcare providers of all types cover operating expenses with appropriate oversight mechanisms. It will make sure that all childcare providers are paid through the pandemic and beyond, and it will provide funding so childcare providers can purchase the important uh, personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies they need to stay safe and cover other increased costs during the pandemic. And then finally, and importantly, this legislation will give parents relief from the high costs uh, of, of co-payments and tuition. The other bill, the Child Care for Econ Economic Recovery Act, will provide more funding for states and create a new tax credit to help employees access affordable child care. Together, these two bills will make a game-changing investment to protect and improve the vital child care sector by providing immediate relief uh, and support. So now I'm going to turn it over to to Rashid Malik, Senior Policy Analyst for Early Childhood Policy at the Center for American Progress, a Washington DC based think tank. He is the lead author of the organization's most recent research on childcare titled, The Coronavirus Will Make Childcare Deserts Worse and Exacerbate Inequality. Following the presentation, we'll hear from a panel of experts and answer questions from the audience. And finally, I want to uh, let everyone know we are live streaming and a recorded version will be shared afterwards. So Rashid, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Am I on now? Great. Um, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, to join this, this, this uh, discussion and for using your platform to, to raise awareness and to call attention to this unprecedented uh, difficult moment for child care providers and families across the nation. Um, as the Congresswoman mentioned, we're um, happy to, uh, to, to get our, our new report out in the past few weeks, um, which is an update to our work on studying child care deserts. As many of you know, there's uh, not just the problem of affordability and quality, and access, but one crucial component of that access is simply supply, proximity, having providers that are licensed quality nearby so that the, con the convenience that parents and families need uh, to be able to, uh, to access those programs and, and to, uh, to work if they want to, um, is uh, that, that proximity and, and, and that neighborhood connection is crucial. And with the, the chronic underinvestment 
that we've put into our childcare sector over the years has produced a, 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 a you know a, a predictable symptom of severe undersupply relative to the demand that's out there. But this is not. While, while childcare deserts are ubiquitous across all states and in many regions, uh, this doesn't affect all families equally. What we've seen in our research is that um, childcare deserts disproportionately impact low income and middle class families. They are uh, very, very common across rural America and in our small towns. They're uh, often disproportionately affecting communities of color, such as uh, predominantly African American neighborhoods. Hispanic communities are frequently childcare deserts. And if we don't create a rescue fund in this stabilization package that's coming up, um, our estimates show using um, uh, survey data from the National Association for the Education of Young Children that we could lose up to 4.5 million slots for children uh, ages zero to five. And that will disproportionately affect those communities that have already been underserved. And that impact will not be distributed evenly. Our fear is that, you know, without immediate substantial action, there could be a, a childcare system in the near, very near future that is only able to serve the most resourced and most privileged families. And without childcare, as the Congresswoman said, it's going to be hard to find our way back to a functioning economy. Um, childcare is the oil that makes the engine of our economy run. And it's been subsidized for far too long by the low wages of a uh, predominantly female led uh, business sector with 93% uh, uh, of childcare workers being women. Um, the, the investments that they have put in in, the, in terms of their labor and time and passion uh, cannot really be matched, can be matched by very few other industries, um, especially when we consider the fact that many of them are doing it for near poverty wages. Um, the Center for the Study of Childcare Employment at the University of California has found that up to, and maybe perhaps even more than half of childcare educators um, have to use some kind of government assistance to make ends meet because it is, uh, it's, it's just not, they're not even able to send their own children to childcare in many cases. So uh, I wanted to call attention uh, before I move on to, uh, a few other pieces of our research to our updated interactive tool that the Congresswoman mentioned. Um, this is at childcaredeserts.org. Um, if you had visited that website in the past, you'll see that it's got a totally new look. And I wanted to spend a moment uh, to just explain what you'd see on there and, and how you can use that website. Um, this will show you where the families are, are most affected and actually allows uh, anyone to compare childcare deserts with a host of other factors, uh, such as the neighborhood demographics, economic characteristics, levels of education, uh, so that you can for yourself see in your neighborhood, in your town, or in your state, what are those co-determining factors for uh, the, the low levels of licensed childcare in your community. So on childcaredeserts.org, we you'll now see um, a as, as when you first open it up, it will give you three policy stories. We are actually highlighting three stories, but you can you can um, search uh, in the search bar by clicking on the compass icon in the top uh, and search anywhere in the country. It covers all fifty states, um, but we we do have some some stories on there that you can learn from and that illustrate the main, main findings from our report. Um, those show the, the unique shortages uh, in Milwaukee, in Detroit, and in San Jose. Uh, but you can also, like I said, find any neighborhood across the country by inputting your zip code, your town name, or your address. And those uh, dots that you'll see on there actually represent families. 
Uh, these are not the childcare providers, but it shows where families live and the color that they're shaded from blue to orange will show um, the level of childcare supply near those families. Uh, we're actually able now to, um, to, to look for the overall supply of care within a 20 minute drive uh, of, of every family in America. And you can see now um, a, a really detailed granular understanding of, from a family's perspective, um, how difficult it can be to find childcare. And when we don't have enough childcare nearby, when, uh, when it's as expensive as it is, when our system is uh, as underfunded as it is, uh, what we find in our research is that this causes um, fewer mothers to be able to stay in their jobs in the, in the workforce if they wanted to. Um, it may cause them to cut back on hours. It may mean that they can't use licensed care for all the times that they need and so they are putting together a patchwork of care, uh, paying for the care that they, they can access using unlicensed, uh, unregulated care that uh, to, just because they have to, um, and then relying on you know, their, their uh, nearby village of support of family, friends, neighbors. It really doesn't have to be this way. And, uh, and, and when we look at our, our peer nations, Canada, and, Britain, France, Japan, you name it. We spend pennies on the dollar what they invest in families and young children. And these investments, as the Congresswoman mentioned, they pay off in the long term, absolutely. They, uh, they help children uh, in their, their most crucial learning years, but they also have immediate impacts on our economy. And, and we've seen the business leaders uh, stressing this point that childcare is a, is a crucial work support for their employees and for their parent employees. So uh, I hope that you'll all be able to check out childcaredeserts.org. Um, we also have uh, our report and, uh, and an accompanying uh, letter from uh, open letter to policymakers signed by a hundred prominent economists uh, showing their support for this uh, $50 billion investment in our nation's childcare infrastructure, uh, just as an immediate uh, stopgap, save you know, uh, really like like the congresswoman said, it's it's a first step. Um, but um, but without without this immediate substantial uh, uh, relief package, um, we're going to see inequality just skyrocket. We're going to see uh, a system that was, was just barely hanging on, literally crumble before our eyes. And it will cost much, much more to bring it back. Uh, and, and, and we all know that, um, that it was already uh, uh, really facing uh, tough times. So uh, I don't wanna to take too much more time. I'm happy to, to let us move on to the questions and answer your questions. Uh, I hope that you'll check out childcaredeserts.org um, and, uh, and that you will um, uh, look at our resources on our, our website on AmericanProgress.org, uh, where, where we have a whole host of uh, other resources and, and analysis to, uh, that you can share with, with uh, your, um, your friends, with your members of Congress, if, if you're not in uh, Congresswoman Bonamici's district. So thank you very much again, Congresswoman Bonamici, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you so much, Rashid. We'll, we'll now begin the roundtable portion of our event. Joining Rashid, we're lucky to have Stephanie Schmidt, a senior policy analyst for child care and early education at the Center for Law and Social Policy. Melissa Botaich, vice president for income security and child care and early learning at the National Women's Law Center. Lucy Ressio at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Dana Hepper, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Children's Institute. Andrea Peluso, Executive Director at Family Forward Oregon. And Nancy Harvey, a family child care provider in Oakland, California and a member of the Service Employees International Union. For the roundtable discussion, we'll alternate between questions submitted online ahead of today's event and questions from live participants. If you would like to ask Congresswoman Bonamici, 
Rashid or our other panelists a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom page. When we, my colleague Natalie will read out the screen name to let people know when it's their turn to ask a question. She will mute and unmute your line for you. We'll get started with the Congresswoman asking the first two questions of our panelists. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks again to, to the panelists. And, and I'm going to ask this in the order of the introduction. So the, the question, will you please begin by painting a picture of the current state of childcare from your vantage point? What are the biggest challenges facing children, families, and providers today? So let's start with Stephanie. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, both for the question and for convening this event today and for having me on the PA the panel and all of your um, leadership on this child care issue. Um, this is a great and very unfortunate question to have to answer right now. In talking about the current state of child care, it's really important to acknowledge that the child care system was already, as Rashid highlighted, in a crisis due to years of inadequate public investment. Um, that have led to a system that really is financially unstable and unable to meet the need that exists in the country for child care. Families were already struggling to afford child care and child care workers were already making very low wages. And the pandemic has just exacerbated all of these gaps in the child care system for child cares that are closed or are operating under reduced enrollment um, across the nation. Um, we know that um, parents are paying um, fees to provide the childcare um, that exists and resulting in providers operating on very thin margins. We saw in the recent Bureau of Labor Statistics um, data that came out at the beginning of this month that the damage to the workforce as a result of the pandemic has been significant. Um, even though there were small gains um, in May and June, um, as a result of folks returning to um, their jobs, the childcare industry has lost almost 260,000 childcare jobs since February, which is about a quarter of all of the jobs across the sector nationwide. And since women of color hold a disproportionate share of childcare jobs, um, these job losses likely impact these women and their families most of all. And finally, what I'll say is just, we know that permanent childcare closures are going to hurt children and families and workers and hold back um, economic recovery and the supply of childcare in low income communities and communities of color, which was already lacking before the pandemic is likely to be hardest hit, uh, which will have devastating consequences for parents who need to go to work and their children who will be left with no safe options as states and communities reopen. So unfortunately, the current state of child care is a very dire one. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, now, now let's go to Melissa with a perspective from the National Women's Law Center. Thanks so much. And I would plus one to everything Stephanie said. Um, I don't want to eat up too much time repeating it. But I will say that um, not only as a child care expert, but as a mother, um, you know, with this, with what's going on with the schools this fall, um, the uncertainty around reopening, how folks are reopening, um, it's going to create, it, it exacerbate the crisis that's already existing right now. Um, there is a high degree of anxiety amongst parents, teachers, school staff, childcare providers across the country, uh, because we don't know. We don't know. Um, and that level of uncertainty, that means that we actually have to invest, not that we shouldn't invest. It means that we need to invest in the stability of the sector, of the women, um, and predominantly women of color who are the workforce behind our workforce, uh, because there is no economic recovery without childcare. Um, and I think that that is one of the Absolutely. things that people who are pushing for premature reopening or who are pushing for only a focus on the jobs numbers need to understand is that we will set women's gains back, uh, family gains back by race, by gender, by income, by education, by decades um, if we don't invest in childcare now because we're basically telling um, a more marginalized sector of our workforce, uh, you can't be both a parent and a worker. Thank you. That's a, a really a powerful perspective and the uncertainty. And uh, I, I hear daily from constituents. Uh, it, it, people are, are really concerned about what might happen. Lucy with the National Association of the Education of Young Children. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, again, for, as many have already said, for convening us. And I will absolutely echo what Melissa and Stephanie have already said 
earlier this week, we released survey results from our third survey, which was open from June 19th until the 30th, where we called out specifically, uh, we reached out and elicited responses from providers from across the country. And we were able to receive responses from over 5,000 providers and educators across all 50 states, Washington, DC, and Puerto Rico. And there are some key data points that I think are particularly important for us to elevate during today's conversation that expands upon some of the points that both Melissa and Stephanie have already shared. One of the most alarming of which is that our data uh, illustrates for us that uh, only 18% of programs are confident that they will be able to stay open past a year without public assistance. So in reality, right, when we think about that, that means that 41 out of every 50 child care program anticipates closing within the year if they do not receive additional funding. We are seeing, uh, to Rashid's point about the need to be able to assess how these closures are happening across our country with an equity lens, uh, that 40% of programs are certain they will close without additional public assistance, yet that number, that percentage increases to 50% for minority-owned programs, right? And so we have to be very mindful then if we are considering the impact of childcare that serves access to high quality early, early learning, what does that then mean for many of the providers, many of them women of color who are losing their businesses, right? These are women who have dedicated their lives. And also we know that there are men in the field, but uh, disproportionately there is significantly more women. What does it mean to have this devastating blow? Um, we are also seeing this blow to something that Stephanie alluded to um, in terms of the workforce. So one in four early childhood educators reported that they applied or received unemployment benefits and a full 73% of programs indicated that they have or will engage in layoffs, furloughs or pay cuts. Again, thinking about what does that mean for minority owned business, the situation is far worse. 88% of minority owned businesses said that they have resorted to these measures in order to survive, right? So we think about this, this is both a deep impact at the individual level with the programs and the providers themselves, but also it trickles out into the families that they serve, the communities that they are a part of, and ultimately our economy and our society that will not be able to withstand this recovery if we do not strengthen and invest in the child care system. Thank you. That was that's really powerful. And, and to emphasize the repercussions that it's affecting the, the people who are doing this very, very important work, uh, the providers, but of course it affects the, the families they serve and their communities and the economy. Um, that, next, let's hear from Dana Hepper from the Children's Institute right here in Oregon. Dana, Hi, welcome. thanks. Thanks for this opportunity, Congresswoman. I wanted to speak specifically to the impact of the current child care situation on child development. Um, you know, child care providers play a critical role in supporting um, children's healthy development and nurturing their love of learning. Um, and yet as a society, we haven't given child care providers the economic support they need to be their best with children. We haven't give them, given them the um, professional development support they need to thrive. Um, especially across all settings when we think of children who are being cared for in family friend and neighbor care and family homes and in um, centers. And, um, and we haven't supported child care in a way that allows children to build long term trusting relationships with those adults which we know are critical for child development. I know in Oregon our average utilization of a, of a subsidy for child care is only four months. So you can imagine children bouncing from care provider to care provider. Um, that's not good for providers, families, or children. This has a disproportionate impact on children who are Black, children who are Indigenous, and ch other children of color. Um, they're more likely to be served in child care settings that the system provides the least support to financially and in terms of professionalization. Um, children with disabilities are also more likely to struggle to find child care and keep child care. And all of these children I've named are more likely to be suspended and expelled when they're in a uh, care setting that doesn't have adequate support. So um, 
the good news is that we actually, we know how to support childcare providers. We've done big federal studies. We know how much it costs. We know how much providers should be paid. We know how to provide them support across a variety of settings. Now's the time to take action on what we know and make the financial commitment to make it happen. Thank you so much. What a, what a powerful and important message about the, the, the need to invest in, in, in our children and the next generation. And uh, next is again from Oregon, Andrew Peluso, Executive Director of Family Forward Oregon. Welcome. Hello, thank you so much for, for hosting this today. It's such an important topic. Um, I would, would echo a lot of what's already been said about how um, there can be no recovery without childcare. Um, there can be no functioning economy without childcare. Um, but that's never how we've treated childcare or this sector in the past. And I, I think this pandemic has just laid bare how essential this work is and how vulnerable the sector is. Um, I, I, I would add that I think it's clear women and caregivers are really struggling right now. Um, this is a recession that has hit women harder based on the kinds of work that they do, but also based on the kind of uh, intense family care that is needed right now. Um, they have been relied upon for far too long to cover massive gaps in our social safety nets and our lack of care infrastructure as mothers, as family care providers, as child care providers, and others taking care of adult, other adults and seniors. Um, and they're, they're struggling right now to balance all of those things. They're trying to keep working without some of the basic employment protections that they need to be able to keep earning an income and care for their families. They're seeing health requirements roll out that they cannot comply with themselves or uh, with their families because of their need for income. Um, they're seeing, as someone mentioned, plans for schools to reopen in ways that aren't aligned with the way work works currently. Um, and I think there are a lot of, of desperate parents and mothers in particular who are struggling to figure out how to, to make it work during this time. Thank you so much. And um, also, I, I, I want to mention, uh, we, we are, in, and I know this is something Family Forward has worked on in the past, we're also like one of the only, if not the only industrialized country without paid family leave, which also makes a difference in getting the, uh, the next generation a good start in life. We have a very important voice in Nancy Harvey. She's a, a family uh, child care provider from California and a member of SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. Welcome, Nancy. Glad you're with us. Thank you. Good morning from California. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Bonamucci, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this roundtable. Uh, I'm a child care provider and the owner of Little Nancy's Primary Schoolhouse, a home based child care program in Oakland, California. I became a child care provider almost 17 years ago when I left a career as an elementary school educator so that I could focus on making sure that children in my community would begin kindergarten with the necessary skills that they needed. Over the years, I've seen firsthand the ups and downs of working in this industry, but these past few months have been extraordinarily tough on my career. Before COVID-19, I cared for 14 children and employed four assistants. Generally, 12 children were present in the program at the same time. Now I care for half that number, seven children between three months to four years old. Two of my assistants are still with me, but I had to let two go. My union fought for my state to provide us with PPEs and to pay for children in the child care subsidies program based on enrollment rather than attendance. This is what has allowed me to keep my doors open. Of course, I've had to institute new health and safety precautions. Now, when the children arrive, we do temperature checks, take off shoes, wash hands immediately. The parents are no longer allowed inside and we greet them at the door. And we spend half the day washing toys like mad. We also do our best to social distance with the children, but it's extremely hard. Our children are very young and they don't understand. They're accustomed to sitting down for circle time and literally climbing in our laps. And no matter how many precautions I take, there's still risk for me and my staff, the children in the ch child care and their families. In March, I had a family that, that caught COVID they didn't notify me until a month later. 
It would have been nice if they had notified me immediately. But as providers, all we can do is rely on parents to be responsible. As far as challenges go, too many providers have dropped out of the industry. Too many of us don't have good health care, and we're afraid of simply getting COVID. The finances were tight even before COVID. Now they're unworkable for too many providers. Many parents have pulled their children out of childcare. Some lost their jobs, but some are teleworking and are using this as an opportunity basically to save their money. They expect, however, that providers will be open when they're ready to send their child back to childcare, but a lot of the programs are not going to be able to stay afloat. Our state was paying us based on enrollment, but that program lapsed on June 30th. California, like so many other states, has a budget crisis. That's why we need federal help for child care immediately. Thank you Thanks. so much, Nancy. Uh, it, it's, it's really enlightening to hear about the, the challenges of, of taking care of young children during a pandemic and the concerns that you and others who are doing this really important work uh, have um, at, at this, this really tough time. Um, the, the second question is about CAPS research that, that Rashid uh, just shared with us. And I'm gonna ask everybody what you found to be most surprising or most concerning about it. But first I wanna ask Rashid, for those who are, are listening, who haven't had a chance to look at the, the, uh, the research yet, could you tell us a little bit about like, what, what definition of childcare desert, for example? So that pe when, when we're talking about it for people who haven't had a chance to look at it so that they understand uh, the, the implications and the, and the, the, the significance of, of what you found in your report, Rashid. And then I'll ask others for uh, their, their input on uh, what they found to be surprising or concerning about it. Absolutely. We, uh, we established this working definition for childcare deserts uh, a couple iterations ago, and it seems to be generally accepted and pretty useful now, which is that we're, we're looking for areas where there are three or more children for each licensed uh, capacity slot, to use a kind of jargon. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's basically we know that uh, from, from birth to five, roughly from, from government surveys that about a third or maybe a little more than a third of children of that age are in a regular non-parental uh, licensed childcare arrangement. And so it, it really only does capture that licensed childcare universe, but that's you know, what we think uh, we should be investing in. Um, what, uh, um, so, so you know, it's, it's that three to one ratio um, it's based on licensed care. So, so what you're seeing there is, uh, is what's available to everyone um, and, uh, and, and takes into account Head Start and public programs. But it doesn't necessarily, you know, one thing I do want to highlight is um, it's not equal for access for, for, uh, for four-year-olds versus two-year-olds versus one-year-olds, right? It's not, there's a, there's a whole several levels of dimensions uh, that complicate this for families. Um, it's it's stark and, and disturbing to see that these shortages are so widespread. Um, when you look at infant care, um, especially as you mentioned, without uh, uh, you know a federally mandated or funded paid leave program, uh, it is extremely extremely hard to find licensed care for your infant. Um, and this is. Um, this is mixed for just heart-wrenching, difficult choices for parents, um, especially mothers um, wanting to go back into the workforce, um, you know, struggling with the new and, and higher costs of, of having a young child. Uh, this, is a, this is a time when we should be, a moment in, in families' lives when we should be supporting them as much as we can. And we are really uh, have been falling down on that job for a very long time. Yeah, and I, I found that the uh, statistic that I believe it's 25%, pre-pandemic, 25% of new moms went back to work within two weeks uh, of giving birth, which is, is just unbelievable. I, you know, 
as moms, we know that that's just um, not getting our, our families off to the right start. So um, I'm just going to open it up this time. Who would like to go first and talk about your your what you found uh, with CAPS report to be surprising or concerning? Where what what really stood out to you? Who wants to start? I'll jump in. Uh, one yes, of the th thank you. One of the things that for us, it's just it really highlighted what we are hearing from providers and from early childhood educators across the country. Um, again, I have the privilege of speaking on a day-to-day -day basis with providers from across the country. And recently I had a conversation with an early childhood educator from Oregon. Her name is Caitlin, who has been part of the field for over a decade. And one of her biggest concerns is the fact that already the state was experiencing there were a number of childcare deserts across the state before the pandemic. Now, because of the closures that have happened and because many programs are struggling without the support, there is this problem is going to be further exacerbated, right? We know that what has happened as a result of the pandemic has really been a spotlight on issues that have been part of the industry and part of the sector for a very long time. And so what I think has been most powerful about uh, the report that CAP has released and that Rashid has worked on is to really highlight for us that this is a problem that is really manifesting itself right now, but that has been building up for a number of years and the consequences of which will be felt for generations, right? We are talking about, yes, the opportunity for families to be able to return to work, for individuals to be able to contribute to our economy, but we are also talking about the deep value that high quality early learning has for young children, for their ability to be able to grow and develop in a way that will continue to um, allow them, right, to be able to be contributing to our society and to be realized full selves. And so I think that what this is really highlighting for us is this is a problem of access to early learning. This is a problem about affordability. This is a workforce problem. This is an economical problem. Um, and it is something that is being lifted up, not just from the organizations and advocates that you see on the panel today, but just this week, there was a letter that was sent by 22 attorney generals from across the United States that were lifting up what this crisis means, a childcare crisis means for them and their respective states. And so again, this is not just something that surfaced as a result of the pandemic, it really just exacerbated an existing problem that will continue to really deepen and have some truly devastating consequences if we do not address it uh, in this moment. I appreciate that. And, and I, I think uh, maybe out of crisis comes an opportunity. And Melissa, I saw you raise your hand. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank Rashid for, and Cap for this report, because one of the things that is most, um, both concerning and surprising to me, but also I think what makes the report so helpful is the way in which it visualizes the fact that childcare should be a public good. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> we have taken, uh, we have, we have completely disinvested from our care infrastructure in this country. And we basically privatized and offloaded all of that risk onto individual families and providers. And so you can actually, by putting in your zip code, by putting in your address, you can actually visually see what that looks like in your own community. And I think that that's powerful because just speaking both from what I know of the research as well as from my own experience, a lot of times people internalize childcare as a private problem. As I, I gosh, it's just so hard to find good quality, uh, affordable childcare, or what's wrong with me that I can't get it together, or whatever it is. And you look at this, and wait a minute, it's not me. You know, this is this is a collective action problem. Um, and I think that that's powerful, not just in this moment for a policy tool where we need to be figuring out investments and guidelines to address supply, but it's also, in, it's also an important resource as a movement building tool, because what it's going to take to solve this is a social movement that is led by and centering providers, parents, and those who are most directly affected. Um, and I think that this is a whole new tool in the toolbox for people to see at the local level that this is not this is not my individual failing. This is a collective societal problem to, to resolve. And, and it will help 
the, the collective society when we solve it. So who, who but, uh, wants to yes. weigh in? Oh, I'd love to jump Eddie. in. And say, um, I think what's most concerning is obviously the, the really disproportionate impacts that we know uh, that this crisis in general, but this childcare crisis also specifically will have on black and Latino families, on um, indigenous families. Um, and they're exactly the families that are, are more likely to be tracked into low wage work, to be um, more likely to be laid off, more likely to be exposed to this virus, um, and in all other ways have been impacted more during this crisis and for, from a history of economic inequality. And I think that's something we're, we're holding as we look at the future of this sector. Um, but I think another important thing from this report is that it shows how important public investment is. Um, you know, in the, we do have greater childcare deserts for infant and toddler care in part because we have less existing state and federal investment in programs to support infants and toddlers. We have more in the forms of things like Head Start for three and four year olds. So we have smaller deserts. There are still deserts. There's still a lot of work to do. But we see those gaps narrowing. And I think this report also demonstrates that in some communities where there's been greater federal and state investment in support for childcare, um, the system is a little more stable or there's more access for families than in places where there's been less of that. So it's clear what needs to happen and that it will work. Um, I think the, the question that Melissa is asking is more, you know, do we have the will to do it? Well, I, I see very, very positive uh, steps with the bills coming to the floor. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging. So. I, I'd like to chime in if, I'm, Nancy, if I may. You know, the article was an excellent article, but you know, as a, as a person that's on the front line, nothing was surprising because I've been on the front line for 17 years. Unfortunately, childcare has always been an afterthought to most people. And I don't, they don't even realize how important the industry is until they actually need it. And mm -hmm. so now, as, a, as we've all spoken to, because of the pandemic, everything has been exacerbated. We have a saying in the African-American community, when everyone else catches a cold, we catch pneumonia. We have pneumonia right now. And we're relying on the federal government to step forward and do what it should have done years ago. And then we wouldn't be where we are today. We cannot forget the importance of everything that child care providers need. We deserve adequate health care. We deserve a decent retirement. These are the, the key essential uh, items that attract people to the field. Yes, this field is a labor of love. However, please don't take advantage of the fact that this is a labor of our love. We too deserve to have a livable wage. We deserve for our families to be stable. We don't deserve to be in poverty as we see other families and as we help other families grow and thrive. However, when we look at our own families, we're falling down further and further down the economic ladder. So it is time for America to step up to the plate and do what they should have done years ago. And yes, I'm gonna say this, they owe it to us. Do you know why? Because we have helped build this economy and it is time for everyone to really band together and recognize this fact. We're not going forward until we, we solidify the foundation of childcare providers. That was, I, I wanna applaud. Thank you, Nancy. I'm so glad we have your, your perspective and you're absolutely right about the value of, of what you are doing. And, and we need to recognize that uh, as individuals as, uh, and, and as a society. Um, I, I look at, you know, the, the federal investments are, or federal budgets are a statement of values. And, and we, if we value our children in the next generation, we need to value the people who are, are taking care of them and educating them and preparing them for life. So thank you. We're so glad. Right. To have your if, if I can interject, as I'm on a roll preaching here, you might have to <laughs> shut me down. <laughs> But keep in mind, we are just as important as the tech worker. We're just as important. Tech workers make, you know, quadruple the amount of money we make. However, we keep their children. We keep their children. And so it is only fair. Um, I have said this before, 
And, and it is not a racist statement. It is a truthful statement. Treat me as if I was a white male in the high tech industry. So that would mean what? A decent wage, uh, valued. I, I might even come out with a bidet. <laughs> I like to say that because they, these tech workers get everything they need, which is wonderful, but our industry deserves it too. So the, the value you are fight. adding is absolutely yes. Um, yes. equal, right. if not more. So th thank right. you. What a, what a great point. D Dana, did you, or Stephanie, did you want to add anything about the cap report before we go on to the next question? Um, I'll, I'll just add one, one more thing um, that really speaks to what Nancy was highlighting um, and was about what was most concerning to me that the CAP um, report really paints a great picture of is that what's most concerning to me is that we aren't able to address the inequities with the small amounts of money that have come forth um, following, following the pandemic um, and the fact that we're already four months into the um, pandemic and the crisis is continuing to grow. And the fact that we actually do know, to Dana's point earlier, what it costs to um, to meet the needs during the crisis for the child care industry. Um, CLASP and the National Women's Law Center estimated earlier in the pandemic that it will take about $9.6 billion a month just to keep the child care system right. afloat. And so we're already so far behind. Um, so all of that to say that I think um, the CAP research does a really good job of making the case for the need for significant investment and to address the inequities and in access to affordable child care moving forward and, and in the moment. Great. And Dana, did you want to add something quickly? I, I know we want to get to at least a couple live questions. Okay. Um, Natalie, are you going to ask the, do we have a, qu a question waiting from someone? Yes, who's we do have ready? a live question ready from uh, Laura Kirk. I am going to unmute Laura's line now. Hi, Laura, welcome. You should be available to speak. Hi, uh, you want me to just read my first question there? Yes, yeah, that would be Laura. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so with schools being either part-time or completely online again, uh, there's an exponentially larger need, not only for childcare, but also for the support in helping our kids continue their education. They seem to be different topics, childcare and education. Um, but both are really big needs of our children right now. There's already a lack of available childcare and teachers. If our schools can continue to provide online curriculum, could we incentivize childcare providers that help with online learning? Um, could we create and attract both a larger workforce uh, in the next month and a half to try to address both of these needs? That's a great question, Laura. Does anybody from the panel wanna take a stab at that? So, so essentially, uh, Dana, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I would love to weigh in. This is a big passion of mine. I spent about 10 years of my, I started my career as an elementary school teacher, then spent 10 years fighting alongside Congresswoman Bonamici when you were a state representative and senator here in Oregon fighting for public school funding before I started working on child care and other early childhood issues. Um, and one of the things that was really laid bare when this pandemic began um, was that um, many public schools closed and because public schools are publicly financed, they closed with very little consequence to the school districts, teachers and school staff. Um, school districts could close and continue to receive paychecks, checks from the government who finances public education um, and be, be able to do that and keep their families safe. Child care providers, well, as we've been discussing, who provide at least as much value as public education provides to our society, we're faced with a much starker choice. Either stay open, have a financial hit, but maybe be able to piece it together and hang on for a few more months, or and put your family in great jeopardy, yourself, your family, your staff, in great jeopardy of exposure to a global pandemic, or close your business and take a greater financial hit, but maybe keep your family, phys your, their physical health safe, but their economic health is destroyed. So it was a completely different 
analysis for childcare providers and making a decision about whether to stay open and not on equal footing at all with public education when we know it should, which I think is just another reminder of this need for public financing. And I think your idea of bringing childcare providers and, and school districts together in this time right now is a great one. And I know there's some of that work happening in Oregon, some convenings to get school districts and childcare providers to talk to each other so that childcare providers who are caring for children as their schools are closed um, have the opportunity to support those children's learning and development in those childcare settings. But at the same time, I envision a future state where everyone has an equal uh, decision proposition in front of them, where everyone has a chance to say, listen, I can decide whether to work with children every day or stay home, depending on what's best for my family, my staff, um, and my economic future, and that it's not so unequal. So in, in some future pandemic 100 years from now, or hopefully, hopefully there's not another global pandemic, but hopefully we do fund childcare sooner than 100 years from now, um, that, that everybody's weighing in equally. Schools and child care and early learning settings are all figuring out, okay, how can we help support the care and development of children for essential workers while keeping our staff as safe as possible and it's not such an unequal conversation? Dan, I really appreciate that. And I, I also want to point out too that, you know, when, when Rashid was talking about the, the, the work that they did with it, CAP did, um, only with licensed childcare providers, but but as as was mentioned, many families aren't able to find a licensed childcare provider. And I know there is likely, and maybe Lucy wants to 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 um, weigh in here, but uh, probably a, a pretty wide disparity in terms of the 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 educational level, like, because some childcare facilities require a college degree, and they have people who are. Are, you know, have a, a, a lot of experience with early childhood education. So there would be quite a disparity, I would imagine, and uh, across the country in terms of whether childcare providers are able to, to really help with um, you know, quality early childhood education. Lucy or, or Nancy or somebody want to weigh in on that? I definitely want to weigh in on this because I think that one of the misconceptions that and one of the challenges that we are also coming up against is this notion that simply because families need child care to be able to return to work, anyone is able to provide uh, early learning and care for young children. And that is something that we know is deeply false, right? This is highly skilled work that they there are competencies and there's a skill set that uh, providers possess in order to make sure that children are receiving the best quality uh, care and education. Um, that it really is a question about these, this is a workforce that is investing in their learning, that is investing in their ability to be able to best meet the needs of young children to make sure that they receive as strong a foundation as possible um, as they are progressing and moving through life. Right. And so absolutely the question of quality is something that is concerning to us, but really thinking about as we know that so much has moved into the virtual space, there isn't an equivalent of virtual early learning, right? It does not exist. We know that what we have seen in high quality early childhood education is dependent on those connections and bonds that young children have to their to the caregivers and the providers and the uh, workforce that has been able to really meet the needs of children oftentimes in a way that requires that happening in person and so one of the things that we have to be very mindful of that a computer screen cannot replace the work and the importance of an early childhood educator, right? And that we cannot then also say that simply because this need exists, that anyone can fill in this gap when we know that this is work that is deeply valuable, that it is work that is important and that these men and women have dedicated years investing in themselves to have the skill set and the know-how to be able to best serve children and also their families. Um, so absolutely, it's a, a huge, thing that we are continuously discussing and elevating and that this investment in early childhood education and especially at this moment yes it's so that our economy can go back to um, can continue to prosper but also just for the well-being of young children that need this kind of care from early childhood educators and child care providers absolutely thank you do we have time for another question Natalie? Uh, 
Natalie, do we have time for another question? We're a little over. I think we could take one more question. Okay, let's do one more question. Know. Okay, I think Nancy maybe had a comment that she okay. wanted to I, I just Nancy. wanted I just wanted to reiterate. Yes, uh, here in California, actually, SEIU fought for us to uh, be a part of a child care cohort. So for 18 months, uh, I was fortunate that I had, you know, I had college degree and I taught elementary school, but there were providers that that didn't fall in that category. And the cohort was just amazing. It was an 18 month program in which we were with college professors here in Berkeley. And, and it was an opportunity for all of us to learn. It was at our own pace in terms of uh, the classes were designed specifically for childcare providers. And so it brought a lot to the table because we were able to better you know, become more equipped with, with uh, all of the children and families that we work with. So quality is essential. And those of us who are in this field, most of us are constantly taking classes in order to better equip uh, 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 us being able to serve our families and communities. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that perspective. So important. Okay, Natalie, one more question, please. Yes, we'll end on this uh, pre-solicited question. It is, as the Congresswoman mentioned in her remarks, the House will soon vote on the Child Care is Essential Act, a bill that, if passed, would create a $50 billion child care stabilization fund. What would this investment mean for children, families, and providers? Who wants to start? I'll start, if you don't mind. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Okay, sure. Child care providers are essential workers, but too many providers earn poverty wages. With new federal investment, we could keep doors open, pay our staff, and continue to run our programs. Parents could continue to rely on us to go to work and support their families. In California, child care providers receive PPEs through the subsidized program. We need new federal funding so that the state can continue to provide us with PPE and keep paying us based on enrollment so that we can keep our doors open and remain solvent. But we're still in the midst of this crisis, cases arising in our county. For child care, for child care to survive, we will need more than a one-time investment. We need sustained federal support. The economy can't function without our services. We need new federal investments to make childcare affordable for parents and to make sure that we receive a decent wage, have good health care and retirement benefits. As childcare providers like me need a seat at the table to be a part of the decision making on how to recover from this crisis and reshape childcare so that it works for children, families and providers. That's why in California, family child care providers like me are fighting for our union. Going back to pre-COVID, status quo is not good enough. We have to do better for our children and for providers like myself. We need Congress's support so that we can survive and thrive and have all of us realize the American dream. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else quickly wanna wrap, yeah, Dana? Yeah, I just wanna add uh, the children born this year in Oregon and in America are going to be the most diverse, racial and ethnically diverse Americans and they're going to be the poorest Americans, um, children zero to one. Wow. And so what we do in this coming years for young children is going to define the future of our state and our country. And so I just can't see this as a more critical time to make this investment. Thank you, Congressman Bonamici for your leadership on this. Andrea and then Lucy. Yeah, I, I wanna say that this is a sector as folks have noted that's almost entirely women. It's disproportionately women of color um, and their work is most essential to other mothers um, who will be shut out of work entirely if they cannot access childcare. Um, our lack of investment so far in this sector is really a direct result of a long history of systemic racism and sexism. And this is a critical equity issue and investing in this sector will be one way that we can start to address some of the 
economic inequities that our country faces. Um, I think now is the time to really imagine the future we want, um, to imagine what we want for our kids, what we need for our families, for our essential care providers, and for the larger economy. We have to take time right now to reimagine what we need and to build the high quality care, um, the essential workforce that deserves better, as Nancy noted, to build the infrastructure and an economy that really benefits all of us. This kind of investment from Congress would help to stabilize this sector in the short term and, and really recognize its importance during this time and to our recovery. Um, but it could also help us focus on starting to build the comprehensive, publicly funded, universal, high quality childcare system that we need. Thank you, that was great. Lucy, and then? No, absolutely. I would incredibly just like, um support everything that has already been said. And what I will say, Congresswoman, is that the support that has been provided by members of Congress has been helpful, but yet it has not been enough. We have seen particularly with things like the Payment Protection Program that a significant number of childcare programs were not able to access this important support. And particularly for those programs that were in family childcare, they were essentially locked out of being able to access this. And so it is definitely a means of thinking about how do you access the support that does feel equitable, right? That takes into account the realities of this field where so many individuals are underbanked, where you have a workforce that has been historically uh, disenfranchised because of their poverty level wages and what it means to try and provide solutions that come in the form of loans, uh, what it means to ask this workforce to continue to bear the brunt of being able to provide these necessary services excuse me, necessary services without um, the impact that they're feeling. And another thing that I just want to make sure that I highlight is while this, uh, our survey brief in particular was released earlier this week, already there is a lag in terms of what we are hearing from the field and what the data tells us. That programs as every single day passes, they are struggling to continue to keep their doors open. And so there is an urgency for this investment to happen so that it can not only impact the lives of the providers themselves, but ultimately the families, because this is something that is going to be felt as Rashid mentioned and was already highlighted in our discussion across the country, across all families, that everyone will feel the impact if we do not invest, if Congress does not invest in childcare. Indeed, thank you so much, Lucy. Melissa, Stephanie and Rashid, who wants to go next? I just want to say that Nancy is a national hero. Um, <laughs> Indeed. That, 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 no, I mean, I think that the perspective from the front lines paired with the data, paired with what every what everybody who really thinks about the issue intuitively knows is just further leading the way to the logical conclusion that the Child Care is Essential Act and the investments that you and um, other champions have been pushing forward are what is needed right now. Um, as the down payment to get us through this, but also to say, this isn't a one-time thing. Right. We need to rebuild this system and reckon with the racial and gender history devaluing care work that got us here in the first place, if we are going to rebuild in a way that is sustainable. And I just wanna thank you so much for providing this forum for your leadership of on course. the Hill. And I've learned so much Ew. from all of you other panelists and just thank you. It's been a for, great discussion. Um, thank you for participating. Stephanie and Rashid, who wants to go next? I can Stephanie? jump in. I, I um, definitely echo everything that everyone's already highlighted. Um, one um, thing to add is just um, that class does analyses of um, what the investments would mean for um, each state. And in this case, if the Child Care Essential Act were to pass um, with $50 billion as the price tag um, for Oregon, what that would mean is um, an increase in funding of $555 million, which we know um, um, could go a long way to meet the immediate needs as a result of this crisis, but obviously is only a down payment as everyone has highlighted for right. what's needed um, longer right. term. Right, and, and I do point out that what we're asking for is less than uh, Congress gave the airline industry. Now the airline industry is important, but our children, our families <laughs> and our economy are important as well. Rashid? 
Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you to the other experts on the panel. You're all um, incredible. Um, it's been real honor to, to speak alongside of you today. I, I guess I would just, since I maybe get to go last here, I'll, I'll just sort of take a big picture look at things and, and say, you know, we've, as a nation, as families, as um, professionals, as, as parents, we've been through a lot these past few months. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're all starting to co come around to realizing, you know, what we need to, to put our resources and our efforts behind the things that are really, really important for, uh, for, uh, for our families, for our societies. We need to, to pay attention to the inequities, the, the, the suffering that has happened so needlessly and so disproportionately upon so many uh, of our fellow Americans. This is necessary right now, but it's also necessary for us to keep our attention on this, um, this incredible group of, of millions of, of childcare educators out there who have been there for us for decades and deserve all of our thanks and uh, all of uh, the, the 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 money in the world to, to Nancy's point um, yes. that and and we have the resources as a country we do um, we uh, you know other other businesses that that make money hand over fist uh, under their normal business model are going to come back when they can come back childcare cannot come back under a private fees system it's a public good we all reap the benefits of that that and and we shouldn't privatize the cost um thank you well thank you i know we've run over there's so much i we can go on probably all of us for for some time but we've run over but um just in closing thank you so much to our panelists uh, for uh, their insight we know that I mean, we're really at a crossroads right now um, the pandemic, as we know, has exacerbated challenges in, in the childcare system that had already existed. If we don't provide significant and robust government assistance, the crisis is going to get worse. It's going to disproportionately affect low and middle income families, Black, Hispanic families, and rural families. We have a choice that we can make as a country. Please know I will keep fighting to make sure that we choose a path that advances equity by providing this substantial uh, federal investment that will begin to stabilize this industry and beyond stabilization, continue the fight to vastly improve childcare so that all young children have a strong start in life. Our children, all of them are worth the investment. They all deserve a better future. So thank you so much, everyone. I regret that we didn't get to more questions, but uh, everyone's insight was so critical as we move forward. So thanks again to the panelists, to my amazing staff, to everyone who joined us, please keep in touch. And uh, I, I'm going back to Washington DC on Sunday and uh, we'll, be, we'll be voting soon on Child Care is Essential. So stay, in, stay tuned. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.